In our last lesson, we looked at the orchestration at the beginning of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. Now let's look at the start of Tchaikovsky's Symphony No. 6. In the years between Mozart and Tchaikovsky, many things changed in the orchestra. All the sections got larger, and the woodwind and brass added new instruments. Whereas the clarinet only began to appear in Mozart's last works, now the woodwinds normally comprise two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, and two bassoons, and sometimes a piccolo. This means that instead of being just a few colorful solo instruments, the woodwind now can make up a real choir capable of playing chords in various combinations of colors. The horns and trumpets have now become chromatic instruments, so they are no longer limited to the notes in one harmonic series. The trombones have become normal symphonic instruments as well, and the tuba has been added, usually performing more or less the same role as the double basses in the strings, reinforcing the bass line an octave lower. So now the composer can write rich, full harmony for the woodwind or brass choirs, or subsections thereof. This opens the door to a kind of dialogue between orchestral families that was not practical in Mozart's time. In the first measures, we see right away how things have changed. Tchaikovsky starts with a dark solo for the Lowell bassoon, accompanied by the basses divisi. Whereas in the classical orchestra the basses were never independent, here Tchaikovsky uses them alone, divided, as harmonic background for the low bassoon. In bars 4 and 5, Tchaikovsky adds the violas, also divided, filling out the harmony above the bassoon. This marks the cadence of the phrase and opens the register a bit upward. Orchestration changes in mid-phrase should always correspond to important moments in the phrase, otherwise they sound arbitrary. An answering phrase follows, again in the bassoon. This time, after adding the violas as the cadence approaches, Tchaikovsky then ends their harmony and adds a mid-range horn pedal tone, which links up to two oboes and a clarinet, followed by a short phrase in the violas, marking the phrase's peak. The foreground has moved higher now, first into the oboe, then it goes back into the strings, the violas, for the first time. Then we reverse the process, descending back into the deeper register, again in violas and cellos. So overall, this reproduction is structured as two waves. The second one rises higher than the first, and then falls back. Like Mozart, Tchaikovsky uses these simple, salient contrasts of timbre and register to keep the sound always fresh. As with Mozart, registral planning is very salient and significant. Note how many instruments have still not played at all. Flutes, clarinets, all the heavy brass, as well as the cello and the upper strings. When the allegro starts, we have the violas and cello alone. First they play one homophonic plaintive tone, then the top cellos hold a sustained note in the middle, while the others move in sixteenth notes. Then the upper violas lead, while the instruments below have a simple offbeat chordal accompaniment. Then there's an answering phrase in clarinets and flutes. Clarinets and flutes blend very well, so the sound is almost as homogeneous as the strings. The register here is a touch higher than it was in the strings. Then the strings we heard before, violas and cellos, dialogue with the clarinets and bassoons, with a little two-beat descending scale motive. Finally, at rehearsal A, the first violins enter. The texture here has three layers. First, melody in the first violins. Second, harmony in the clarinet, the upper violas, and the lower celli. The clarinet blends exceptionally well with the violas in this register, just shading their color slightly. Third layer is a quick moving counterpoint in the upper celli. This kind of layering is one of the best approaches to orchestration with larger ensembles. When the whole orchestra is playing, there are actually less different possibilities than there are here, since the realities of orchestral balance preclude so many combinations. There's no point having low flutes and high bassoons playing the same register as heavy brass. But there are so many of these more modest combinations that can be made to work, providing endless opportunities for simple, effective contrast effects. After a few bars of this, the texture changes slightly when Tchaikovsky introduces the other half of the first violins. Then the celli disappear, eliminating the lowest register. Now we rise up higher than ever before to our first registral climax in the violins. At the climax, Tchaikovsky right away brings in the basses, again divisi. First there's no middle register, and then two beats later the horns come in along with the violas as the music cascades down. Once again, notice the registral planning. The following passage is an example of how a good orchestrator thinks about doubling. Notice how the bassoon only doubles a portion of the cello phrase. This prepares the way for the next woodwind entry. Flute, oboe, and clarinet doubled at three octaves, now above the strings. 
This is a bit like invertible counterpoint. What was in the base now becomes the upper part. The process repeated in the following bars. Keeping one motive in the strings and the other in the woodwind makes the inversion clearly audible. The timbral contrast enhances the motivic contrast. A similar process, but with three layers, starts at rehearsal B. The rising bassoon arpeggio is immediately imitated in the flutes, while the strings have a counterpoint in sixteenth notes. The horns add the third layer with a dotted note rhythm. Again, counterpoint and orchestration complement each other. Tampera makes the contrapuntal layers easier to hear. At rehearsal C, a dialogue begins between strings and woodwind. We mentioned at the start of this lesson that woodwind can now be used as a distinctive choir, with several possible sounds, depending how the instruments and registers are organized. Here we see a little crescendo. To start, the lower strings alternate with oboes and clarinets, then bassoon is added, filling out the harmony. Finally, the violins are added, responding to all the woodwinds. The following passage at the top of the crescendo is the first tutti in the piece. Heavy brass play the following motive, which overlaps with the horn and bassoons. This is answered by all the upper woodwinds, overlapping with all the strings. Then the dialogue is repeated with the timpani added. Now the upper strings and woodwind are fully doubled for the first time, both at the unison and the octave, playing a contrasting sixteenth note motive. This doubling is necessary because when all the brass and timpani are playing together, neither the strings nor the woodwind alone can balance them out. Notice also that the strings and woodwind are mostly above the brass. The brass family can't go as high as they can. Finally, second bassoon and low strings play the bass line. Only the first bassoon and the violas double the horn motive, the viola also participates in the upper line with bits of the scale motive.
sum up what we've learned here. Limited orchestral subgroups provide the most varied and effective contrast effects. Registral planning is critical for effective contrast effects. Twitties may require doubling high strings and woodwind if the brass have important thematic material. Tchaikovsky does very little cut and paste mechanical doubling between families apart from this kind of twitty situation. As in Mozart, the twitties are individualized. <laughs>